So we are recording. And you have a quorum, Vasu. All right, great. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hope you all had a great week. And welcome again. And this is going to be an exciting session. We have uh, uh, somebody from Greenfield, um, uh, Carol. Uh, Carol Stephanie? Collins. Mm -hmm. Carol Con Collins, yeah. He's going to talk about CPA. So going to be a very exciting session. So again, thank you all. Um, let's uh, let's look at the minutes from last week and vote on them. Did anyone have any concerns or questions on the minutes from the last meeting? I thought they were fine. I would move to just um, adopt them as they are. Thanks, Lori. Second that. And or second it. Thank you. Actually, who's taking minutes uh, this meeting? I think it's Laura. Or is Laura here? Oh, well, Laura's not here. So who's after Laura on the list? Ah, Jesse. Laura's Jesse. Jesse. All right. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> We're here to solve a bigger problem, Jesse. So it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do a voice vote for the minutes. Um, Allison? Yes. Goldner? Yes. D? Yes. Regavan? Yes. Roof? Yes. Selman? Sorry, Jesse. Yes. Rose? All right, minutes are approved. All right, thank you. And uh, let's open up to the public for any public comments. We don't have any public. Okay, makes it easier. All right, uh, staff updates, Stephanie? Okay, um, Welcome back. so I was on vacation, thank you. I was on vacation last week. So I've been, I feel like mostly I've been answering emails <laughs> and trying to coordinate for the next three committee meetings coming up. Um, so one thing I can report back is that the town has applied for funding for an electric school bus. Um, it was only one because the town is not eligible for the 100% EPA funding because of we're not in a specific district. Um, so we would only get, we're only getting, we're applying for some funding to cover the purchase of an electric school bus. So it won't get us all the way there. The other barrier we're kind of facing is that Eversource is not clear that they are going to provide the funding for the infrastructure installment, which they have done in other grants. And uh, so they're still in the process of negotiating that. The DPU may actually require them to do that, but I think last communication I had with my contact there that hadn't come through yet. They think it might, but it just hasn't yet. So there should be another round of Eversource infrastructure support, but it hasn't been announced yet. So um, so one school bus is more than no school buses. <laughs> so that's moving forward. Um, uh, just quick shout out to yep. Stella as well for staying on top of it and communicating to everyone you know in your community to try to get this to uh, get the grant approved, right? So appreciate it. Thanks, Stella. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> You're like, is it me? Is it me? <laughs> no, it, it arose organically, but I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> Every little thing matters. So thank you. Yes. So um so there uh there's that. The green communities uh funding opportunity wow. is coming up in October. We will be applying for that. I'm meeting with the facilities manager. And we are meeting with a consultant who did some audits, um, audit information. So we're going to get that um, for a few specific projects that the facilities manager already had lined up. So we'll be taking a look at those. Some of those are for the months in library. And I think I'm advocating for us to get, you know, transition uh, off of fossil fuels completely over at Munson. Um, and I think the facilities manager is trying to do that as well. So that might be the first building that we could actually achieve that and this funding would help. So um, I don't know, there is a pathway, as I mentioned at the last meeting, there is a pathway for a zero net zero building um, funding, 
but I don't know that we'll be able to achieve that for this application round. Um, when you do, it kind of locks you in for a couple of years and you can't apply for more funding um, until you complete that project 100%. So um, there are some limitations, but I don't think they're, you know, they're, they would sort of push us back too far. Um, I'm excited about the opportunities that are coming up through the federal legislation and the state legislation. I sent you a summary that was sent to me by Sarah Ross. Um, it is an incredible summary with some funding opportunities. So I was so thankful for her coming upon that and sharing it with myself and the um, finance director. So. Um, so we have that information, which is exciting. Um, other projects. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Stephanie, I didn't read sure. that, but is there anything that we can should be doing? Well, that? I would just say read through it. Um, you know, I, I really only took a very, very quick read through, but there's just some opportunities that I think will, it, it wasn't too specific other than just sort of a, a, alerting us to the, um, Areas where we might be able to provide, you know, to get some support for funding, like, for instance, heat pumps for low income communities. Um, those are the types of opportunities, transportation vehicle, transportation mm -hmm. opportunities. It's really about helping communities with electrifying fleets and buildings um, and making that move to electrification. So, um, you know, it's kind of what we've been anticipating and what we've been working towards, which has been something that's been um, sort of common knowledge throughout communities about these are the two areas we really have to focus on. So I think the the government has sort of addressed, is trying to address those primary needs. So I will say I'm a little frustrated though about the Federal Infrastructure um, Act because the, the problem that I have seen is that with the um, electric vehicle incentives, if the engine isn't, yeah, if the engine isn't fully um, constructed in the United States, then we lose the incentive funding. So you actually lose federal incentive funding. And if you, I've been, I've been sort of in the market to try to find, to get an EV for quite a while. And I've been sort of waiting, thinking it would get easier. And it seems like it's gotten more complicated <laughs> and the incentives and, expensive. and, yeah, and expensive. So um, unfortunately, so there, that's a little bit of a barrier, which I hope they'll address. Yeah. Yes, Lori. So I just wanted to point out that there is now, I actually contacted somebody at the um, Department of Energy about this because they had been keeping the list of who's eligible for what rebates. And um, their webpage hasn't been updated yet, but there's another one at, um, I forget which department that is now publishing which cars are eligible. But the problem is they also didn't take away the, the $200,000 cap, right? So a lot of the few cars that are constructed in the US are no longer eligible because the, the leaf and the bolt, for example, because exactly. they many of them. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the prices on those cars are also coming down, especially the bolt. Uh, it's come down exactly $7,000. So yes. you know where the rebate was going. <laughs> yeah, yes, yep. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it is frustrating. I'm also in the market for a luxury vehicle and it's, uh, we should trade stories sometime. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, can send, I can send the link. I can send the link where the current state of things is summarized if I can find it. I'll try to just send it to you afterwards, Stephanie, and you can distribute it as you. As you yeah, see. no, that would be great. And I might even try to, you know, if I can, I, I feel like I want to try to get some of this stuff up on the, the town's website too for information for, for residents. So um, I, if you share that, I would really appreciate it. It's exciting. I think there is incentives for used EVs, which is new. That that was one of the, the few exciting things I saw there. Yeah. So I think that that's primarily what I have for for today. Thanks, Stephanie. And is Anna there, Stephanie? Oh, so Anna. Um, sent an email late that she cannot make the meeting tonight. So okay. unfortunately, we've. I was looking at our agenda. <laughs> it's it's dwindling rapidly, and I don't know when Carol will appear because she had another meeting. And so I just told her to show up as an attendee, and I'll I'll bring her in when she's okay. available. Okay. All right. Any ECAG member updates? Oh, no, I oh, wanted to ask a question, um, of Stephanie. Could you? Um, Tell us about the um, panel that you participated in um, 
in Northampton about the sustainability uh, coordinators or something. Directors. Yeah. <laughs> Andra, can you repeat your question? Sorry. <clears throat> Stephanie knows what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Uh, yes, it's Vasu. I'll just um, launch because it, I was um, I was asked to be part of a panel of sustainability directors to talk about what it is um, we do and also how we think we can sort of make some impact going forward. And it was primarily for the city of Northampton. Uh, there was a group of folks from Northampton that sponsored this forum and invited us. Uh, who are panel participants. And they basically were looking for information because Northampton doesn't really have a sustainability director. It was kind of wrapped into the planning director's role, but I think there are some people that feel very strongly that it should be its own very standalone position. So mm -hmm. they were trying to get information about communities that do have this role and what we do. And um, I pointed out that I was the only coordinator everybody else was a director. So um, I, I pointed that out here. So, um, but it was great. I, and we've had a few, we had a couple of actually follow-up sessions of just the the people who were on the forum panel. Um, we had at least one meeting and we're going to have, I think, some others. And with the meeting that I attended, I didn't, uh, because I was just literally just away from vacation, I didn't have a lot to think ahead to sort of prepare questions, but we actually had some folks from the state, um, from EEA at the meeting, attending the meeting. And it was great because as we, you know, several people pointed out, and I think to your point, Vasu, in the past, when you're trying to contact an agency, it's not ever clear who it is that you should get in touch with and who could potentially come and speak to us and whether they're available to do that. You know, I sort of get the sense it's hard or it's kind of rather difficult for a reason, but there was at least one person that whose name I got who would said that he would be um, available to us and to communities to respond. So I thought, you know, there might be an opportunity there through him to get him to come to a future meeting if you all have like a very specific um, ask of information that you want from, mm -hmm. from the state. So I could reach out to him and he may not be the right person, but he might be able to get me to the right person. And I will say too, that I've, I've reached out to people that I have worked with. I was on the Green Communities Advisory Committee and I think I still am, but I'm not sure. Um, we haven't had a meeting for a little bit, but I reached out to people that I've actually worked with on that committee and about linking, connecting me with other people and have not had responses. So it's not always easy, um, but I think this panel was really helpful to bridge a barrier that has existed. And I think um, we'll have maybe more moving forward. Yeah, Stephanie, I, I wonder if uh, at some point we need to talk about, I know we talked about the decarbonization roadmap as Steve had some presentation, we need to talk about CECP and I wonder if that person can come and talk to us about CECP because it's about 2025 and 2030 goals. So um, maybe there's some value there. Mm -hmm. So connecting the 2025 goals and 2030 goals to the decarbonization roadmap in 2050 and then make that connection to what we're supposed to do in 2025. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm making a note. And I, I would just, uh, yeah, I have set up one-on-ones with all of you, right? We, we I wanna chat with each of you individually. Um, my intent for doing that is to understand your interests, uh, what role do you wanna play, and also how we can engage the community because that, I want this forum to be where there are more people participating. And I don't know, Andra, that you're part of Mothers Out Front. There's all the other groups that you're part of. I don't know how many people go to that, right? We, and typically when we have you know, people on this call, it's the usual three, four people from the community that participate. And I, I, I'm hoping that when we bring whoever that contact is, Stephanie, that we have a larger community partnership uh, in this forum. We could not sure how we'll get there, but well, the other, you know, the other thing that we might consider is just doing it not as part of a meeting, but doing it as like a separate event, 
you know, where we can maybe bring in a few people and have a panel, which is actually, I think, more of a draw for folks from the state too, because they're then addressing a larger audience. And at least, you know, my experience, especially if we partner with like the League of Women Voters, um, events that we've done in the past uh, that have been sponsored sponsored by the league have had a much better turnout. We've done them at the, I mean, this was pre-COVID, but we did them at the middle school. Um, I remember one climate forum in particular uh, that was great. And we had Ellen Story. I think it was, I, I worked with Ellen Story's office on it. It was primarily Ellen Story's office, but they worked with me um, to help organize that event. And it was a great turnout. So, um, yeah, and we had state uh, state senators and state reps on the panel talking about climate change. I can't remember what year, I'm sure I could find some correspondence about it, but it would be great to do something like that again. Mm -hmm. Especially Andrew, Mindy and Joe, something? I feel like they'd be great, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, maybe not today, but I'd like to um, put on the agenda in the future um, what it would mean um, to have a director of sustainability in Amherst and um, what role ECAC might be able to play. Um, okay, I'm sure we can get that on a future agenda. Thanks, Any other ECAC member updates? Lori, you always have something. Well, I'm just continuing on my journey to try to figure out what the heck. <laughs> uh, so I, I will report. I, you know, I, I made a little more progress this week. Only in uh, I spoke with I, I spoke with Block Power. I spoke with two other energy companies, but I still don't really have a complete story. I suspect I won't for a while. So I think I will keep quiet on the heat pump stuff for a while until I have a good story to tell. Um, and a good understanding of, of everything. <laughs> but meanwhile, the other thing I wanted to ask about though, I just had a question really, which is um, I'm wondering in light of the climate bill that got passed in Massachusetts, there are two big climate bills that I guess passed since the last time we met, right? Um, there's a, the uh, IRA federally and there's the Massachusetts climate bill, um, which was signed. And that had in it this interesting home rule petition thing, which I didn't know much about and I, also wonder, this is regards, no, I think this group has been mostly focused on transitioning buildings that are already here, but I wonder if it's worth at some point, I'm just gonna throw this out there as something we might wanna do or put on, the, put on the agenda in a future meeting, whether we want to consider um, trying to push for building code that requires all new buildings to be, uh, you know, greenhouse gas free, um, and whether or not we want to put our own home rule petition in to make that happen. Um, the idea being that the more communities that push for this, the more likely it is to happen. Right now, there are only 10 communities that are going to be allowed to do it. And uh, it's up in the air which ones are going to be allowed to do it. And it might be, it looks like it might be till July next year until we even have rules about how it's going to happen. But I think the more communities that push, the faster that might happen. So something to think about down the line. I think we have more urgent things right now, like figuring out how to get people to buy into pay, see pace. I'd, I'd like to suggest that um, our building electrification accelerator team might be re reconstituted to focus on this because um, that an initial team got us to the rental um, bylaw work. Um, and maybe we could start a new one um, or overlapping that yep. would focus on um, looking at the home rule petition. Does everybody know what that mechanism is? Even I'm a little cloudy on it still, Andra. So maybe you could if it sure. seems appropriate, maybe you could tell us. Yeah. Um, so Berkeley was the first city to say no new fossil fuel buildings, period. Um, don't know what the law is in 
California, but in Massachusetts, um, we have home rule um, by the grace of the state. And um, the state sets the um, building code. And so localities don't have that power. Filing a home rule petition to um, require all new buildings to be all electric um, was a tactic that was um, started by Brookline um, and then built on by a few other towns that then partnered with um, Rocky Mountain Institute to create this building electrification accelerator program uh, that we participated in. Um, and the goal was to get more and more um, municipalities to pass the resolutions that are um, and, and put in home rule petitions, as Laurie said, to pressure the state, to show the state, you know, people are ready. We want to, to go all electric. Um, and what happened this year with this, um, the bill that was just signed um, was that there were a number of different tactics and um, Senator Michael Barrett from Lexington um, had a hearing that allowed for all of those tactics to be um, surfaced. It included the home rule petitions themselves. Those are, they're, they're like, they're bills, you know, that have to be passed by the legislature. Um, and a statewide um, uh, bill um, from Rep Khan in uh, Newton who, that was to make all new buildings statewide um, all electric. And that allowed for um, a lot of really good information to come out and for um, legislators to advocate for there to be, you know, something in the bill that, that was just passed. And it got whittled down and whittled down to a demonstration project with 10 municipalities being allowed, um, chosen by the <clears throat> uh, DPU to um, try it out. Um, to, to show that you can build electric buildings, you know, um, and and so now. So, Andra, this is only for new buildings, though, right? Only for new buildings. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, and my, my question was, how many new buildings do we have in, in that come up in Amherst, and do we really see value if we focus on that, Laurie? I, well, I think it's the heat just, pump program. I yeah. think is more valuable, but. Do we have a lot of buildings that prop up every year? We yeah. have new buildings every year. And um, yeah, we do. it would make a difference, not just here. You know, right. part of the, the point is to have a, an impact on the state. Um, yeah, so that's why I say it, we should put it, it, it's not our top priority right now, but yeah. I do think it should be on our agenda. I think we should yeah. push the council to do because it helps everybody. It yep. aids in this effort, you know, overall. Yeah. And a part of that discussion, we should also be looking at the um, specialized um, stretch code that the um, DOER just proposed um, that does not allow you to go all electric in your requirements. Um, but it, it has a lot of good things. Um, so. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, any other ECAC member updates? Okay. Uh, Anna is out. Uh, there's a zero waste bylaw. So I don't think there's a lot of changes or any changes at all since we last looked at it. Um, it's going in front of the console on September 22nd. I don't believe we should vote for it. Um, we've already approved it uh, six months ago. So 
any questions or concerns on not voting on the uh, zero waste bylaw? If it would help it um, look be looked at favorably, why wouldn't we you know, reaffirm our vote or whatever? And also, doesn't it now have a final version that we should look at? We were going to look at something. Yeah, it hasn't changed much as looking at uh, what was originally sent and reviewed. Um, it's not much. And we have four of the six or how many counselors are there? Four counselors are for it at this point. Uh, I know Anna is not, so um, not yet, right? I don't know what her position is. And it might have been a good forum for us to talk to Anna about it. Um, but, okay, do y'all feel that we should review and vote on it next time we meet? Yeah, I think we should have a look at it and just and just uh, give it another, just a quick, you know, should be should be pretty quick, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, and just give it another vote of confidence that this is something we should do. And we should certainly communicate that to Anna and our individual representatives. Okay. Stephanie, do you have the final draft? Um, I may have it, I may, I certainly have access to it, but as much as all of you do, if it's sent into the town council's packet, everybody has access to what's in their packets. Okay. So when, let's see if I can um, dig it up. Do you, do you know, Vasu, the timing of the council's? September 22nd. So we have time. Yeah. We have time, but I don't know if we're going to meet before that and we want to talk about that as the next topic as well um I, I know people are out next the next meeting laura cannot make it stephanie cannot make it um but okay i'll i'll take the action item now to send the draft to everybody um for the zero waste bylaw yes don so what at this next council meeting what exactly are what are they supposed to be doing are they voting to send it to planning are they i mean where procedurally is um uh is the council on, on the proposed bylaw uh i'm not exactly sure don i'm trying to uh or unless somebody else knows um i just know there's a next meeting the proposal is now in town services and outreach committee with a request that they report back to the council within 50, 90 days. So I'm not sure I can, I'll but, see if I can dig up some information and it, I don't know who the best contact would be to fill me in, Stephanie. I was just gonna say, if it's at the TSO and they're reviewing it and they're charged with making a recommendation to the council, so they have to do their process with reviewing it, come up to a decision, as to recommend or not, and then they would bring that to the council. So the council would then vote, is my understanding of the that pathway. And so would I, should I be reaching out to the TSO to understand the timeline better? Yeah, uh, yeah, you might check in with TSO or you know, TSO or you know, the or um Lynn or Athena. Okay. In terms but of Stephanie scheduling. Is that the final step or does it need to go to planning? I mean, does the council then, <clears throat> if they vote to endorse it or move it forward, what, what is the next step? So, well, yeah, if they, I mean, if they, it's going to be, if it's, um, if it's written up, um, then planning would be involved in the drafting, uh, which they may have been already. I'm not sure. Um, but typically it does go through planning as well as the council. Mm -hmm. It's hard because like not everything has the exact same pathway when, you know, when I showed you the solar bylaw, yeah. you know, it's just things, it depends on what it's addressing. So I'm not a hundred percent clear on what other uh, committees would need to review. It's already, I know that the health, uh, the board of health has already looked at it. Mm -hmm. So I think they made a recommendation. So I think it's gone through some of that gauntlet already. Um, and I think if the town council adopts it, then it's, that's kind of like the final. Yeah. And then we have to find somebody who could do the job, right? So it goes through a coding process. 
So right now we have Monopoly in USA recycling. So that's going to change in the future. Yes, Sandra. Um, given that the TSO must be you know, discussing it now, um, and you know they may not remember that we already contacted them about it, maybe just an email to them reminding them that we had previously um, endorsed the um, the plan. Um, that would be, okay. So, yeah. are you all okay with what's already been decided? Yeah, so you are okay with just me sending an email out on behalf of ECAC instead of voting? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if it would help, um, we could try to find the last letter that was sent in support. It should be in a packet, so I can okay. dig that up for you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, vacation now. I know we're not part of the agenda. It's not part of the agenda. Um, so is everybody planning on attending our next meeting on September 7th? Can you all make it? I will be in the Southwest hiking somewhere. Okay. And Laura cannot... Um, Stephanie, you will not be able to make it. What about the rest of us? Andra, okay. So if you have a quorum, which it looks like you do, then I can ask um, IT if they can have someone basically just do the, the Zoom um, coordination. And typically what they could do is just They'll set it up, they'll start, and then at some point they'll just assign uh, you as a host, Fasu, okay. as chair, and then you can just close it out when you're done. Okay. So they'll get it going, but they may not stay for the whole thing. Okay. Because I want to take the next meeting to talk about strategy and what we're planning on doing. So that's why the meetings with all of you individually and then roll it up to actions that we can't take just be very focused, right? And I've heard from some of you that, you know, the best time or the best effort was when we all worked together on something common and it was the CARP. Um, so uh, it's gonna be something like that. So we'll, we'll chat. I'm sorry, I'm gonna miss that. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're Question. gonna keep Yes. Yeah, do you want to talk about the meeting on the 21st too? Because I think you have more folks. Oh, Dwayne is not going to be, I think, I think Dwayne said he can't be at the next meeting also. There was one, I'm sorry, I can pull up my email from him, but there was another meeting that he said he could not attend. It may be the meeting on the 21st. And I know, Andra, aren't you out on the 21st? And Laura and John. John. And Laura. So that might be the meeting that you... Okay. Potentially don't have a quorum for. Okay. So is the recommendation to cancel that meeting or just postpone it to the following week? I think you all need to decide what you yeah. can do. Are you excited to have another meeting? That means you would have two meetings in a row. It's just right. about, for me, it's just the logistics of posting. But if you could let me just take a second to... Open my I, Stephanie, maybe I, let's cancel it. I think uh, there's going to be, after our conversation next week, there might be some actions that we can all take. And uh, it's going to take some time anyway. Um, so let's cancel the next the meeting on the 21st. And then we'll catch up on the 5th and mm -hmm. talk about it. Oh, sorry. That's your Go ahead, Steph. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think the fifth is Yom Kippur, so I won't be here. And I, my sense of this committee is a lot of others won't be as well. <laughs> we don't take well, but also we don't have, um, we don't typically hold meetings in town hall hmm. for a high holidays. So. so that might mean a meeting on the twenty eighth, and then getting mm -hmm. on to a new every other right schedule. Yeah. Yeah, I would. That would work yeah. fine. 
Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so cancel the 21st and October 5th and schedule one for the 28th. For September 28th. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and just shift, I think we should just shift everything then, just, just two weeks after that, right? We're just shifting the schedule. Sure, I mean, we could do that. That's fine too. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to the change all my Zoom 12th. settings, but that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so you so you're so September twenty eighth, and then you said October twelfth. Uh, twelfth. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will try to attend. Sounds like the next meeting is going to be pretty important, so I will try to attend. No promises, but I'll be in Arizona three hours later. OK, let's move on to CPACE. And uh, is the Greenfield? Um, no, Carol is not here yet. Um, I think she said 530 to me. So, OK. Um, I can give a brief solar, but well, is uh, Stella is Stella going to be? Stella, are you talking about? The yeah, I have a couple of things I can talk about. It'll be quick. Right, Stella. Yeah, so I actually just got back like two hours ago from a road trip visiting my friend who's um, a former college roommate, but it was actually kind of an ECAC work trip because she happens to be the transportation planning manager for the city of Durham, North Carolina. Um, She's an engineer and an urban planner. So she sent me some things because uh, mostly we were not chatting about that, but we also were chatting about that. And um, she sent me some things that might be of interest that I'm gonna send on to Stephanie. And then I keep trying to find a TAC meeting to go to. I think I just might need to write the chair if you wanna just send me Stephanie at some point um, who to write. Cause it seems like they're not meeting super regularly. I don't know if that's like quorum issues or vacation or what to just all kind of, of above. all of the above. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To just kind of get a handle on what's going on over there and um, what opportunities for, for collaboration there might be. If you um, can't, if we can't get in touch with the chair, I can at least connect you with staff who are liaisons yeah, to that committee. That would be great. Um, and then, yeah, kind of on the note of if anybody, it can be hard to find people with expertise to chat if anyone wants to hear from the transportation planning manager of Durham, North Carolina, uh, let me know. During, Durham is doing a lot, actually. Yeah, she's really smart. I mean, obviously, she's my friend, so I'm going to say that. But uh, she was working for the Triangle, like the buses before, and I don't know. So is there anything worth sharing um, from what your friend sent now? Um, I, I don't think so. There's some concrete like trainings and webinars and things, um, but I don't think there's a, that that Stephanie can send around if anybody wants to go to them. Okay. Any questions for Stella? Okay, uh, the solar bylaw update, um, Stephanie. Sure, so the group had a meeting on the 11th and um, a lot of that was um, discussion about the decarbonization plan. Martha Hanner gave an overview, she read it and then gave an overview to the committee. Um, and one of the things that came up that I think is relevant to this group and especially Steve is that Martha kind of ended you know, there was the question of what percentage of this plan is Amherst responsible for. And Steve, having already basically done that calculation, I was thinking today as I was driving that it might be a great opportunity, and I'm sure Dwayne has already thought of this, but to have you present your information to that solar bylaw working group, because some of them may have seen your presentation previously, but there are others that I know for sure have not. So as a committee, it might be good to give them some food for thought. So um, Dwayne is not available right now and I'm trying to pull together the agenda for our next meeting is on the 31st. 
Um, so I don't know if Steve, A, you would be available. They're meeting from 10 to noon. Um, I'm sorry, from noon to two. And um, B, if you're willing to do something, you know, at that at that meeting. So if you're available and willing, um, I could at least pose that to Dwayne. Let me check. You said that's August 31st? August 31st from noon to 2 p.m. I could be, yes. I'll just be jumping out of class close to noon, but um, I could jump right into that. Um, yeah, I, it, I did bring up that concept of sort of what is Amherst's share when I did my presentation. And I, I got some useful feedback and pushback and alternative views, which I think were all really uh, fascinating. It's a tough one to pin down. So I would approach it as here's one way to do it, which I did it just by population portion of Amherst population to Massachusetts population. Um, but I don't know that's the best way. It's certainly not the only way. People pointed out that there are towns in Eastern Mass that have such high population and small area that they, they wouldn't be able to meet their goal even if they covered their entire town with solar. And I think that then other communities on the flip side, like some of the less densely populated communities might say, oh, you know, we only need about 10 acres of solar and we're all set, we're done, um, which perhaps is not quite the, the best way of thinking about it. So there may be some other ways of doing that. So uh, that could be a fun discussion. And I guess I would wanna maybe connect with Dwayne to think about how we frame that conversation. Yeah, and Martha's um, presentation was really interesting because in looking at the, the state map, um, you know, in terms of forested land and agricultural land, you know, the concentration of the most viable agricultural land is out here. And so, and there's very little in the eastern part of the state. And then we also have sort of the largest um, portion of forested area and the state is out in Western Mass. So it seems like, um, those are things worth noting, you know, just in, in my looking at it while she was presenting and thinking about it, I was thinking how, you know, there's a case for really preserving agricultural land because it's all very concentrated and it is out here. Um, but maybe the point about the forested land, whereas the majority of forested land is out here in the strait, may make sense to sort of consider on private land, maybe, you know, there's uh, more leeway or, you know, there's specific areas that the community might consider that would be allowed for clearing if, you know, the committee sort of looks at it in that perspective as more of us in, in relation to the state, not just the town, I guess is what I'm, the perspective that I sort of had in looking at that. So. Yeah, it's, it's um, uh, just rereading even this afternoon the the update to the clean energy climate plan and there's a nice chapter here on Massachusetts natural working lands um, that emphasizes the importance of the working lands for all sorts of things ecosystem services and wood products as well as carbon sequestration um, and, and that's important the I found the other chapter of the plan on electricity, um, clean electricity to be quite vague in terms of exactly how much solar we would need as part of the plan. And I think they're deferring until that statewide assessment can be completed, the, the technical assessment um, for solar capacity across the state. And I think that's gotten started, but it's probably at least a year out from being completed. Um, so yeah, I, I'd love to do a conversation uh, what I want to try to avoid is this sort of solar versus forest mindset. I don't think that's productive. I don't think it's necessary to pit them against each other. Um, but perhaps by just looking at the total amount of solar we need and not addressing the details of where it can go, uh, I think can help people prepare at least for the future conversation as to where it could go once we have a better sense as to total amount we would need. And I think that's what they were looking for. Okay, So, perfect. you know, I think presenting that as one approach and that there are actually other ways of trying to define what that responsibility is, yeah. um, is helpful to sort of bring up 
the alternatives, but even just having one clear defined way, pathway <laughs> of looking at it, I think would be helpful for them. So I'll, I'll certainly pass along that you could potentially do the next okay. meeting, so. Good, and is the, um, I missed the previous meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Is that recorded and available on Amherst? Yes, they are. Yeah, they are. Well, actually it's, yeah, it's on YouTube. So Amherst has a website for all our recorded meetings. So if you go to Amherst YouTube, Amherst YouTube, okay. they're all listed. And if you go by date, they're, you know, they're listed by date. And they, I know they are there because I've, I've looked them up myself and included links in the minutes. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, sorry, but you brought up something that I just wanted to address, which was the assessment. Ah. Um, because I forgot to mention that. So the the update there is that we only had one proposal. Hmm. And I, because I was on vacation, I haven't really had a chance to dive into it, but um, Dwayne and I are going to hopefully meet. Um, I, because he's away, I wasn't able to actually connect with him, but I did send him an email with a copy of it and uh, wanted to meet with him to sort of discuss it. I don't know that I can share that quite now because of procurement law and issues. So I'm not going to say who it was, but um, as I said, there's only one. I did talk to the finance director about the possibility of, you know, looking at it if we don't think it's going to really meet our needs. Could, you know, are, there are two options to us. One would be either we could sign a contract with them and then we can request um, services up to 25% more and add on to, you know, the, the cost of what they've bid for um, that we would pay them. So we could include, you know, it could go up by, you know, an additional 25%. And I will say that I think they came in low. All I did was look at the price and I was skeptical at just what they submitted for a cost for a six month assessment of the entire town. So um, there, that's one approach potentially that we could do if we don't feel we um, are getting what we need. And if we have a conversation with them and think that they can do more then we would, we can go that route. The other option is that if we review this and we think that it's lacking in what we were um, identifying in our scope of work, if they're not really meeting the scope of work, then we can basically just reject it. We have to have very specific reasons why we reject it. Um, and then we could, I guess, reach out to some of the firms that didn't bid on the project. There were two, there were three interested total and only one applied. So we could reach out to the other two and then maybe some additional ones that we think, you know, might have and why they didn't. Um, we could reach out to them and sort of ask them why they didn't bid and maybe alter the proposal, the request for proposal to reflect some of those responses. So that's another option, but obviously, as you well know, that means more time and it's just delaying, <laughs> you know, delaying this. But I, I don't know, in my mind, I, I think we want a quality product. Yeah, uh, Stephanie, the timeline for solar assessment should kind of run parallel with the solar bylaw working group, right? Yes, I mean, ultimately, that that will serve as a tool for them to refer right. to, but it's not, it's, this has been a really challenging sticking point, <laughs> because it's not, in and of itself, it's not driving the development of the solar bylaw. It's a tool that can be referred to in terms of maybe um, identifying, you know, having the, having the finished product and then using that to sort of identify the prioritization of where we may or may not be able to develop solar. I mean, I'll tell you, looking at, Chris Brestrup also did a presentation of land use at the last meeting. And there really is not a whole lot. I mean, there's just not going to be a whole lot of um, available space to develop solar. So, you know, it's where battery storage and, you know, community solar and being the off taker for other projects elsewhere may come into play in terms of Amherst trying to meet some of its goals. So, um, so anyway, I think, you know, it's it's a tool, but it's not 
and it would be helpful to have it done before the solar bylaw is finalized for sure. Um, I don't think. And when is that, Stephanie? So yeah. that's due May 31st. Okay. And I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know that this is such a hard and fast deadline that for if for some reason they needed more time, I I would think they would be able to request that the council give them more time. Um, and so the, you know, the assessment was sent as a proposal for a six month assessment, you know, from start to finish, it would take six months. Um, but you know, now we're getting into September. And if we do, if we do have to go out to bid again, for some reason, if we don't, go with the one proposal that we got, you know, we're looking into maybe October for receipt of proposals. So um, I, it still gets us within, you know, I think it still gets us within that time frame, but it's going to be tight. Yes. Is it, is it possible that the statewide assessment would suffice for Amherst? And we could not spend the money and do one specifically for Amherst and wait for the statewide assessment to be complete. So I think the so the company that the firm that's doing the statewide assessment was one of the ones that was potentially interested. The focus was a bit different. It's not as specific as some of what we were looking for. So um, it might be more general. It could certainly help, but I don't know that it's going to get us the level of information that we were hoping for. And that was the that was the response from the folks that were potentially interested. I, interested. I am going to reach out. I, I do have the email that was sent to um, our accounting department. So I'm going to reach out and see if I can get more information from them about what they're doing and how it differs and, you know, why they didn't why they didn't apply. And, and another possibility is for um, a smaller scale assessment would be to see if um, folks at UMass, uh, various departments there have pretty good expertise in GIS, whether they might be able to address at least some of the questions that the town assessment was hoping to get. And probably could do everything, but perhaps tick off some of the high priorities and then the statewide assessment might fill in the rest. Well, as I said, I'm meeting with Dwayne to review the proposal. So I think, and, and I'd like to review it with him. So I think the two of us will go over it because he was going to be on the committee to interview the, you know, the uh, respondents. So he and I will talk and I think, you know, I'll, I'll mention this as a possibility too, but, um, but, you know, it may be that the response, like I said, I really haven't read through um the proposal yet I haven't had a chance to really sit down and and digest it and because I want to do it with the scope of work I want to make sure that their responses are directly related to the scope of work and it may be that they did you know address things sufficiently that we would go with them so this you know conversation might be moot you know perfect I think that's a great plan yeah good question Steve uh Andra um we did have a GIS um, survey done as a part of the um, research for the CARP, correct? We had a very baseline. That was really, really baseline. The subsequent one that we had done that I shared with you all, um, it was very specific to 10 sites, but some of those sites are ones that we do absolutely want to develop, like the high school parking, you know, for solar canopy. Um, so some of that more really in-depth analysis was done under that report. The the one that Niche Engineering did was really very baseline, and they also looked at a few, they were also looking at a few specific locations in particular for um, the possibility of solar with battery storage, and they were looking at like housing complexes, community housing. So, so um wouldn't it be nice if we could have a map with the potential places overlaid, the 10 locations that we have more information, you know, overlaid on that um, with 
in information that we know so far. Um, so, you, know, yep. you already have information from Chris Restrup about land use. Right, so the planning together and, yeah. and, and maybe see that, oh, we have 10, the 10 most likely sites already studied. There's only five other ones. Yep. Just focus there. So we do, so that the land use map that Chris was referring to was done for the master plan. So it's actually the land use plan that's part of the master plan. Um, the information that you're, the way that you're sort of laying this out, we met with Mike Warner, who is our GIS specialist for the town at a meeting for the solar bylaw working group. And when we were talking about the things that the committee was looking for, and Duane was basically articulating that on behalf of the committee. So he really was very knowledgeable of, knowledgeable about, about what it was he was asking for. Um, he, Mike's response was basically like, I, this could potentially happen, but it's not an easy, it's not like you just take these things and put them together and that you have what you need. It's much more complicated. Um, so it's not, I don't, I think he sort of said it's not impossible, but it's much more involved than it sounds like it would be. It, it sounds easy to just do those things. It's like requesting the data from the rental registration process, you know, that Steve is still waiting, I think, to get what he's looking for. So again, you know, it's, it's not that it's impossible, but it was gonna. It's gonna take a lot to to do that. And um, I think what we would do is take the information. I mean, certainly when we bring the consultant on, we're gonna give them the CARP. We're gonna give them the master plan. We're gonna give them both solar studies that were previously done. You know, so they're gonna have that at you know their disposal to use as reference and to sort of have some some places to start. I mean, it will probably give them a jump start. As you said, yes, Steve. I was just going to add the 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 question that comes up um, largely in the public sphere is when we talk about the amount of solar that we would need for our 2050 goals. A lot of people say, "Well, great, but let's put it on rooftops and parking lots." Um, and so the question that needs to be answered is beyond those 10 specific sites, because the amount that we need for the 2050 goals, if we do it by population, is, I don't know, 10 or 20 times greater than what those particular sites can provide. Um, I've done, I've played around a little bit looking at large rooftops and parking lots, and my own analysis is, is fairly limited um, in um, spaces there. But I, I look forward to sort of a more professional expertise analysis of that. So that that's the question that comes up. And I think we need to sort of figure that out, um, hopefully during the time that solar bylaws is being developed so that it can take advantage of available rooftop and parking lot space um, and not preclude too much uh, other kinds of lands from potential solar development that would prevent us from reaching our, well, what we might eventually decide to be our fair share for the 2050 um, statewide goal. So Vasu, I just wanted to point out that Carol is now here. So okay. can I let her in the room? Yes, please. While you're doing that, did everybody notice that California banned the sale of new gas cars? And All right, that's it. New cars that going forward? In this 2035, starting in 2035. Okay. Wow. So, so if I may, can I do an introduction? Yes, yes please. Of my my colleague and um, an inspirational friend. <laughs> so um, Carol is the director of sustainability and energy for the city of Greenfield and was kind enough to um, come to our meeting tonight to give you all a an overview of the project, the CPACE project that they did, which was the first in the state, I believe. So um, Carol, with that, I'm handing it over to you. Yeah, thanks Carol for doing this. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to this. 
Oh, well, you say that now. I don't know how much <laughs> I'm going to wow you. It's been a while. So, um, but it's, it's a, a pleasure to join you. And thank you to Stephanie for inviting me. And um, we did indeed have the first PACE project in the state. And it honestly was, we couldn't have asked for a better project. And um, so I don't know if, Stephanie, are you able to pull up the few slides I sent or should I? Sure, I can do it if you'd like. Just give me a minute and I will set it up. Okay, I, I really, um, I had done a presentation with MCAN a few months ago and that was really to encourage other communities to participate in PACE uh, because there was a lot of hesitancy among municipalities. My understanding is that Amherst has already taken the vote and is already participating in PACE and that I, I, I'm not sure if I'm correct, but um, please feel free to chime in, but it was more, um, you're looking for information on how best to do outreach or um, get PACE to, to kind of be on the radar and help the people that it can help. And it's a fabulous program. Um, so is that, I see some nodding, so I'm gonna-, I'm gonna Yeah, that's how can we get people to make use of it, yes. Okay, right. great. So- and, and also addressing how can we, does it, how does it impact the low income communities, right? I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and Carol, I had to do this as a PDF, so I'm just gonna kind of scroll through it for you. All right, there's only a few slides, but one of yep. it starts with a beautiful picture of, we had this blighted property in our downtown for decades and it's now class A office space. It's the offices of the DA because it's around the corner from the courthouse. But this whole section of Greenfield, this was really the kind of the last building that hadn't been revitalized and, and what a transformation. And um, so, you know, Mass Development was also really happy that they, they got to kick off with, this was really the intention of, of PACE was to, you know, we accomplished so many goals, not only taking a blighted property and turning it into occupied space, it puts it back on the tax rolls. They did every um, thing that we would wanna see, you know, putting in high efficiency systems and HVAC solar on the roof. And um, in the end, it was, I just put at the bottom, it was $450,000 in PACE financing to accomplish this project. So it wasn't all sunshine and roses though, being the first, I, I've now, my, my uh, motto is like, I, I will do anything, I, I wanna be second. I just don't wanna be first in anything. And um, it just took a long time for, for all the kinks to kind of get worked out. But overall, PACE is a beautiful program that really doesn't involve the municipality all that much. Basically, um, in this case, the property owner came to me looking for any funding or just available assistance to make these energy upgrades because he was already committed to doing, you know, the the high efficiency um, method of of rehabbing the building. So he happened to come to me right after we had adopted the PACE legislation. So I was like, you know, there's this new program it seems like maybe that might work for you. So it, again, just serendipitous that it all worked out. And um, so I just, again, I think you may not be interested in this, but, but in Greenfield, it was um, the previous administration was extremely eager to adopt PACE and really wanted to hop on as soon as possible because the previous mayor was very, um, you know, uh, one of his platforms was to recruit more businesses and to really support the business community. And um, so, you know, it, it really is, I mean, for, for our world, we, we wanna see energy upgrades and having this financing available that typically isn't available for upgrades like this is fabulous. But it, it really, when it comes down to the end of the day, it's it's an economic development tool also, and, and really kind of, um, in, in my mind, kind of first and foremost, because there's a lot of financial pieces that go with PACE that I just kind of like, 
will never understand <laughs> like balance sheets and all of that kind of stuff. But I would just say that um, again, with, with Greenfield and the previous administration that we started this whole program under, it, it was very much conceived of, of rolling this into kind of how to recruit businesses to come to Greenfield and, um, and support them. So uh, again, as I think you're all aware, this financing is not typically available. It's tied to the property. They, um, and if I misquote a few things, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, slight refinements as the process has continued. So I, I may not be up on, on the most recent, but I think the terms, they go up to 20 years, which is again, great for property owners. And because it stays with the property, it allows them to, to take on projects that wouldn't be economically feasible otherwise. So, um, uh, as I mentioned also a little bit, but I'll just touch on again, one of the reasons MCAN did the presentation that they did back in March was to just um, allay the fears that municipalities had all being strapped for time and um, resources that really once a project seems eligible for PACE and, and kind of has gotten through the first tier, mass development takes it over from there. And then they do the rest until the time of the closing, which this um, slide here, how did C-PACE happen? Oh, I think, I think they call it just PACE now. It was C-PACE for commercial PACE. In other states, they have residential PACE also, but I, I think it's now just PACE. So I think on other slides, I, I, I just mixed and matched, I guess. But um, so one of, one of the things I wanted to touch on is that because again, the administration and other departments such as in, in our case, economic development and Amherst, it may be other departments that interface with business owners a lot more frequently. Um, in, in our experience, it's been a lot of times that, you know, the mayor would inform a business owner or, you know, a, a prospective property owner of PACE if it um, might apply to them and then they might come to me so that I could kind of feel them out. Um, I think I might have it on the next slide, but uh, really, I mean, I have a, I've worked with a lot of businesses on doing energy upgrades for their uh, projects and have done that in the past. Uh, position. So it's something that I'm a little more familiar with because one of the things, yeah, there it is on that, on that slide. Pace is really, and again, I don't know if they're changing this, but um, thus far it's been for projects that are larger than $250,000, which they kind of, it's somewhat fluid, but that that's really where it's kind of come down because I've worked with a lot of property owners that were interested in doing upgrades and it just turned out they weren't eligible. And again, it goes back to this financial piece that uh, it, the numbers need to work on in terms of cost benefit analysis to make the financing work because they do have to work with a lender um, as part of PACE. And uh, that that figure seems to be the the, I guess the smallest number that it can typically work at. So um, again, in, in the case of the project that did happen, that was larger than 250,000. From that project, the architect was also working with another business owner that came to me and is also now uh, pursuing PACE, another absolutely stunning project. And I can't wait till that goes public, but it's gonna be just marvelous. But in Greenfield's case, we don't have a huge market for that tier of upgrades. So most of the business owners that I've worked with, um, like for instance, there was a new bike shop. They were really committed to doing all clean energy upgrades. They weren't gonna get anywhere near that $250,000 threshold. So I tried to work with them for uh, other opportunities that they could take advantage of. And then we also had another um, large property owner that did want to take advantage of it, but their economics didn't work. So PACE is an, a fabulous tool and it's really great, but uh, kind of what I wanted to hit on in terms of outreach is that 
I, I don't see it as a, a blanket answer, even though it is for, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but um, the person that brought up the, uh, I don't know if it's income eligible projects. I mean, nonprofits are eligible, five plus family buildings are eligible and commercial properties. So, um, you know, it, it, it really has to do with the projects working economically to kind of catch, get through the threshold and then working on making upgrades that, that meet the goals that we all wanna see going forward for climate mitigation. So I feel like I'm, I mean, I know this, you know, I'm supposed to be talking, but um, I feel like I've been talking too much. So I might stop here. And um, if anyone has questions or if you want some other information, please feel free. And Carol, first off, thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. Um, sure. I do have a lot of questions, but I'll wait until the rest of the group can go. Okay, so I'm, I guess I'm going. Um, right. I'm ready. So, you know, I, so you talked about the pace for commercial multifamily properties. This is the conversation we had last meeting is whether owners of multifamily properties are increasing their rents because they're financing, you know, X dollars of money for this program. Okay. That's a great question. And I, I don't know the answer, but if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that um, mass development has been so thorough and every component of the program has been uh, vetted. So I would think there might be some provision for that. I, 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 I don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I know I've read of that in other cases could be in other states i just honestly don't remember but yeah that is a great question okay and how long did it take to implement i know you were the first but you were not the, i mean you implemented more of these right what was the we have a, another pro project that's in currently going i i honestly don't know exactly where they are in the process but they they seem to be perfect for pace and started the application process and i mean again the thing that's it's financing, but it's also with um, people that are doing these major renovations. So there's, they just have a lot going on. Um, so if you've ever built anything or, or worse renovated, <laughs> if you could see, I'm, I'm living in, I'm, I'm in between project right now, but um, it just takes a while. So I would say that it's going to be Again, it depends on the project, but in the case of, of the two that we have, they were total rehabs of older buildings, which are very challenging projects and, and really comprehensive. So probably a couple of years, I would say, okay. 18 months to two years. And I believe they say something about, uh, it's really like six months before the closing that things kind of ramp up. Okay, uh, Steve? And then Lori. Yeah, I guess I was interested. Were were you aware of any projects that could have qualified for nope. PACE but yep. chose not to? And if so, why do, do, do you know why they didn't go with it? And then how can we, particularly in Amherst, sort of make those projects more likely to go with PACE? Okay, so I actually thought you were going to go in a different direction. <laughs> um, but I would say, anyway, one thing that I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but because there were um, legislative issues with PACE being enacted, and that was one of the reasons the timeline took longer than anticipated, they, any project retroactive to when, the, when Governor Baker signed PACE into, and I, I'm not going to use the right word, being, I'll just say being, um, which I want to say might be even 2016. Uh, those projects are eligible, retroactive, even though they've already financed and done whatever, they can apply for PACE financing and get that money back. So again, it gets into the financials of balance sheets and, and um, 
how they, whatever, their capital. And we did have a property owner who does fabulous projects, mostly multifamilies and uh, rehabs older buildings also. And uh, I actually haven't seen him lately, but he, he had pursued that. So I'm, I'm hopeful. In terms of your actual question, <laughs> uh, again, I think the only thing that's kept people away from PACE that I'm aware of is just that um, they didn't meet the criteria in terms of the cost benefit analysis or, or, or the financial uh, threshold. But Carol, on, on that note, um, if they didn't meet the financial threshold, you said you still work with them so they can take advantage of, advantage of something. What was that something? So again, in Greenfield, we have a lot of small businesses. So I'm gonna say most of those. So for instance, with the bike shop, they were doing a new heating system. They wanted to do solar on the roof, very small building. I, I wanna say 2000 square feet or something like that. They wanted to beef up the insulin. Anyway, at the end of the day, it was probably a $50,000 project. And so there's, you know, tax breaks that they could take advantage of for the solar and, and some of the upgrades. Mass Save still works with small commercial businesses to um, connect them with uh, incentives. And uh, so I just worked with them to kind of feed them into all of those uh, buckets to, to access. And the great thing is, and I, I, I wrote it, but I didn't really hit on it, but I do want to stress that um, I see PACE, I see my role with PACE as, I mean, the two projects that are already in PACE are property owners that are super committed to doing the right thing. That, that's what I'm gonna call it, the right thing, because we're right. But um, it's also in, in one case, it was an opportunity to try to convince a business owner that was just looking for the cheapest solution, which was a new gas fired HVAC system. I was able to kind of, which is, I believe still eligible under PACE, but I didn't have to necessarily stress that and really push them towards doing, you know, air source heat pumps. And um, so I really see PACE being a very useful tool to convincing, especially when you're dealing with, you know, people that are only looking at the bottom line. It really has to be kind of, um, uh, readily available to them and and not make it difficult to, to to kind of be like oh look we can do this and look at how much you're going to save up front with just and now with the incentives i mean for everything but gas it's the paybacks kind of instant um so anyway i i see that opportunity really being the the big one with pace is is really working with the people that are already in the choir, it's great, it's fabulous because honestly, I'm gonna just say it, it's hard and, and it shouldn't be this hard. And I, I, um, I whine about that too. And I've been trying to advocate for more technical assistance for small commercial projects, large commercial projects, municipal projects, um, especially in Western Mass. I think we're kind of still have a dearth of, um, contractors and experts that can really uh, shepherd these projects. And that was one of the main obstacles with the project that did get done was just they had to go through a lot of different um, contractors to, to get get it right. Lori? Um, yeah, I had a couple of questions. So how many total CPACE projects has Greenfield had? Is it just the three, you have three you've mentioned, the, the retractive one and the two? Yeah, uh, there's just the two right now that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and the first one was just last September. Yes. So okay. this is very, you Early. know, still pretty new. The other projects that they've had happen are in the Boston area. And it's, um, you know, just kind of straightforward replacing like rooftop units and, uh, not necessarily the kind of clean energy push that that we'd hope for, but still yeah. in the right direction. And I was surprised about this two hundred fifty thousand dollar minimum because I didn't actually see that. I was looking again on the right. website. It's not right. there. That's me telling you this, and 
that's from them telling me that, but it's kind of this, like I said, very nebulous that it's it's not an actual hard cutoff. And so so just they're doing um, they're doing some sort of cost benefit analysis, presumably then. Is that what it that yep. will, and what goes into that? Did it, is there any any input, any link anywhere that one can look up as to what goes into that analysis? Is it just is it just a matter of are you paying less overall for energy and everything than this financing is going to cost, or is it more than that? Again, this there's what I understood from the beginning, and then there's been um, several edits to that. But my understanding is that I don't think I should answer this question, or or I I, I can give you my best recollection. Yeah. And so initially, all of the projects that they're going to do that they're going to submit for financing. There's a cost benefit analysis, right? We do this all the time with all of our projects. And so that's one of the ways we decide what's what's feasible, what's not, how, how to you know finance things. So in this case, I'm not sure if it's like with, uh, I know with, for instance, the heat loan typically, or even like with the solar loan that they tried to keep it so that your bill overall is staying roughly the same. Um, but I don't think that's the, the driver behind PACE. I think it's much more that, uh, for instance, as you may know, to replace heating systems, again, in the past, I, I'm not exactly sure with, you know, heat pumps and, and all of that with the incentives now, but um, I think those have become much more competitive. But in the past, it could be 70 years that you'd have a payback on a heating system, and it's 20-year financing. And again, you're still getting a lender. Greenworks lender is the one that that these projects have used, and they're uh, I think very active in Connecticut. And again, like it's really interesting to hear what they have to say. Most of it's above my head, but so so again, they deal in a different language, and and it's all about good financial sense. So does the lender do the cost benefit analysis? Who does the analysis? Originally, my understanding, and I read through all the documentation when it first came out, and again, this is back in like 2018, mm -hmm. and, and since then, I know there's been changes, so I, I don't want to, I definitely don't want to mislead you, and uh, honestly, mass development would probably be the best uh, entity to talk to to get the latest and greatest on all those details, but um my understanding is they worked with like, and, and I'm paraphrasing, please don't um, okay, sure. <laughs> quote me, but I would call them like an energy concierge who would kind of run through all the projects, make sure the paybacks worked in terms of the 20 year term on the financing. And again, the payback that, uh, because again, it's a lien that's going on the property. It's a you know, paid through a betterment assessment, it stays with the property. So they have to also be, I mean, the whole lien thing was one of the biggest holdups with why Pace took so long to um, roll out because that was kind of very new for the state to take that role on. And so again, it's, it's this, I just say money. Can I say money stuff? I say computer stuff for anything with IT and right, money stuff. stuff. Uh, it's five minutes before six. Vasu turns into a robot. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I love it. I, well, yeah, I, I would imagine, um, Carol, that you know, and uh, um, and Lori, that the analysis is done by all of the parties to the transaction. I mean, the developer who's going to do this deal wants to make sure that his or her return on their investment will be able to once, you know, it makes economic sense to that developer. The lender wants to make sure that the numbers work um, for whatever the developer is going to do. Um, in, in your case, Carol, you know, they're, they're going to have a, a new office building, well, what are the rents going to be? And am I going to be able to meet the debt service? And I know it's on taxes, but I mean, am I going to be able to meet that? And it's, it's, I mean, other than a lot of the benefits of this project, I mean, basically it's 
financing. And it's financing that has to make economic sense all the way around. And the biggest thing for the lender is, are you going to be able to pay the debt? Exactly. Eventually, um, once you do this project, I mean, that's, I've worked with mass development before on other things. I mean, that's basically what the analysis is. And it comes from everybody, everybody involved in the project. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm reading as well. There, I don't see the 250K limit or no. minimum, but it says you have to demonstrate that the energy savings from the project will have to be greater than the cost, which is a requirement, which makes sense. Okay. So that's in there too. That was my original thought that that would be the key thing, but apparently that's not the only thing. <laughs> and again, I'm, I'm not the one for the nitpicky details on numbers. My, my goal was to help them implement the energy upgrades that we wanted to see or, you know, help, help them kind of guide through that process. But anything to do with money, I was just like, see you later. Don can help them out though. Don for the win, debt service. That's going to be my, whenever I say money stuff, now I'm going to say debt service. And Go ahead, Jesse. I, I have a money question. Yeah. All right, Don, are you ready? <laughs> Did you have a sense, well, you know, some of the analysis that we do is sort of like, what is, you know, what's the best next dollar spent or what's the, the payback on certain, we're always looking at that. Do you have a sense of which upgrades um, were paid back quicker? Um, envelope, mechanicals, lighting, et cetera. Did, like, were there any big wins um, for that project? So that's a great question. And I'm gonna um, not to, to pass it off, but that's also stuff that's, you know, we're quantifying that has always been a, a, a challenge. And finally, we're getting to a place where there's a, a ton of resources that are coming available. So I would recommend, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Built Environment Plus, and they're out in uh, the Boston area, but they've been compiling reports showing for all different building sectors, the increase in costs for doing um, Net zero, net zero ready. It also incorporates, you know, Boston's been, I don't know if it's Birdo so much, but just uh, really getting down to the nitty gritty on the dollars and cents. And I'll just add that I would typically say, you know, and, and this is really how you make these arguments is, you know, um, and I, I wish I had all this stuff at the top of my head, but it, it changes, but like with insulation, so I would say em envelope is typically your best dollar spent, but that's new construction because it's so much harder and more expensive to add it later. But the other thing is like, we just did a library and we wound up getting triple glazing, which was such a big fight and struggle, but the incremental cost was very minor, which surprised all of us. And um, it's actually looking great if you ever get up to Greenfield give it a few more months and it'll look like a library. But um, so I, I don't know, but um, you know, cause I think somewhat it's gonna be project specific, especially because I don't know if you're aware that PACE is not for new construction. It's only for existing. Although from what I've been reading, they're it really pushing and hoping to have new construction added which will make a big difference. Steve. I guess I, I had a question for our community and maybe Don or Jesse might answer this. How many projects do we have on eligible buildings that are in the 250K or greater renovation activity? Is that, are there many of these going on each year or just a few? That, that it, there's a lot of projects over that amount of money um but, to, but they're not they're not you know small businesses you know looking you know it, 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 it they're bigger projects obviously but that's that's actually a, i would say that is a relatively low threshold for for a construction project um mm -hmm. so yeah I don't know if that helps. 
Well, it sounds like there's lots of potential projects that should be considering the CPACE program. And then the question is, how do we connect those, the people in charge of those projects, at least introduce them to the CPACE program so they can consider it? Yes, Stephanie. I really think utilizing the bid and the chamber are your two best yep. pathways of getting yep. to them. Yep. And it's as simple as, you know, they have regular meetings. It's as simple as getting on an agenda and doing a, a presentation. Mm -hmm. And we might even be built, able to get somebody from mass development to, to come out yep. and speak with you. So I would really highly encourage, and I, you know, that's part of my role. I can help make that happen. Yeah, I would totally concur. I think that's, I didn't, I forgot about the bid, but definitely someone who's much more tapped into the to the business community. Mass development, Wendy O'Malley is the administrator. She's out in the Boston area, but she's fabulous. And, and um, we've been working on this since the beginning. So she she uh, is up on all of the details and, and can answer any of those debt service questions that come up. And if, can I add just one more thing? It's kind of like on a different tangent, but just in terms of the municipality's role, one thing I would add, which I did put in, in one of the slides, but in, in our case, um, the assessor and treasurer need to be involved at the end when the betterment assessment comes due and there's a closing and um, it needs to go on the prop property tax bills. And, and so that's the one other piece that the city or the municipality provides. They actually have to bill and collect the betterment assessment. And um, so I would just recommend uh, they were never really informed that they had a role in, in PACE. So when we did finally get through all of the hurdles, that came as a surprise and it was just uh, not great timing. So I would just recommend um, bringing those departments in sooner rather than later so that they can be aware. And again, mass development will guide the whole process, but there are some requirements and some things that they need to do. That's the part that's about six months before the closing that you wanna have in place. Stephanie, uh, and then Jesse, Andra. So um, just quickly, it was really the finance director who was the one who led um, getting us to become a, a PACE community. So um, our finance director is already knowledgeable about PACE and we've met with Wendy O'Malley and he had more direct correspondence with her. I was copied and I was involved, but really he was the one that took the lead on establishing this because it was more identified as like a financial opportunity. So um, that was more in his domain. And he was identified in the climate action plan as being a lead. So, you know, he ran well, our plan. He did it the right way then, bravo. <laughs> yeah, so I think, you know, he's aware. Um, and if we move forward with the PACE project, you know, he'll want to be on board and he'll get other people in, on board. I'm not as concerned about them not knowing. But thank you, Carol, because that's a good heads up. Jesse? Yeah, I, sorry if you already said this. I was typing and maybe not listening at the same time. But is does... I know a lot of funding streams that come from state and federal places come with a lot of additional hoops and requirements that make them less appealing to people. Would you say that the kind of extraneous requirements were burdensome to the, the business owner, to the architect, to the builder? So again, I'm going to say there were so many things just inherent in it being the first project yeah that it's really hard to tease out but um i would say that everybody was smiling by the end all of the different parties and like i said the second project that we've gotten came from the architect who did the first one so i i would say that's a testament that um and and again because it was a historic building they did go for uh i are there historic tax credits still? I think that's what they did. And uh, I have a feeling those are no easy task either. So um, I wanna say that I, I do know, again, from, from working with mass development that 
they their intention is to try to make it appealing. So, but the other thing I do always say is when you're getting free money or access to something that's really good, you've got to do a lot of work for it. So, but um, yeah, that's the best I can provide. So um, my question's along the same lines. Um, does it then involve a lot of encouragement, educating along the way um, on your part? Not or on not, my part. No. Nope. Because again, you know, as with any project, new or, or renovations, you want to get, you know, do the energy part before you're designing or at least concurrent with your design. So that's very early in the process. So once that's kind of all set, then, then they're getting led by, like I said, the, you know, the kind of the financial entities and it really had nothing to do with energy from, from my perspective. Uh -huh. So the um, example you gave of um, encouraging one of the developers to do um, an HVAC system based mm -hmm. on heat pumps was that was in the planning stages. Yes. And I mean, honestly, it was very frustrating because I could not find an HVAC contractor that could deal with his project. And so I, I know Amherst is a different animal and you have much larger things going on, but we're, we're kind of our projects are, you know, too big for the small contractors and too small for the big contractors. And so we kind of get stuck on a lot of things. This is one of those projects. So I honestly am consciously avoiding asking him how it's going <laughs> because I spent so much time trying to, I, I was so, and that's part of, part of the issue that we're all facing working in this field is just there is this money, there are these incentives, we all wanna to work towards the same goal and then it's nearly impossible to get there. So it really doesn't make the job easy to kind of be like, all right, you gotta do this, you know, which is why I think it had the, it might be a different conversation had the property owner that did go through PACE not be so, um, you know, uh, adamant that he was gonna do the right thing. I think he probably would have had an easier time. He definitely would have had an easier time had he not. The other thing is the gas moratorium has been our best friend. So all of our buildings are all electric. I don't think it would happen otherwise. So I thank Berkshire Gas every time I talk to them. I keep it, keep it going. Um, so that, I don't know if that helps, but. And I am all, I, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say this all helps a lot. This is awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And every time someone says 250, I feel like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get beat up. So I I know they made it clear, like that's not it's not published for a reason. It's it's not a hard and fast number. I'm sharing that kind of as colleagues. So maybe I'm being um too naive, but I, I don't want that to be the thing you leave with it's just more basically what they've told me in the past is if i have a project that i think is good to kind of send it to them and then they'll they'll figure it out they do the number crunching but that was the number that was kind of thrown out that and i think as as they get more projects they may refine that but um so it's more just to tell you in terms of I wouldn't go around to, you know, and again, Amherst has a whole different um, structure in terms of your commercial base and, and nonprofits and all of that. But um, in, in our case, with all of our tiny thousand square foot mom and pop storefronts, those are not gonna be eligible. So it was just helpful for me to not waste my time, not waste my time, but you know what I mean? That's not a focus for this project. And um, so please don't, if you tell if you tell Wendy 250, she's gonna be like, oh, did Carol talk to you? So anyway. Yes, Doc. Yeah. Um, Carol, I really appreciate. I mean, you just, you know, hearing that 
it's the architect who who brought <clears throat> pardon me the second possible project to you um i think that's wonderful to throw all this on jesse's profession um to you know deal with particularly with you know rehabilitation projects where you don't necessarily have to go to the planning board you know it's it's really about getting together with your architect putting together uh you know plans to to rehab and the architect being somebody especially in our community you know to be to be an instrument to encouraging developers to go down this path um i, I think that's a big deal um huge personally. so anything else for carol oh you had something go ahead well, I was just going to add. Uh, so, Jesse, you're an architect. Is that what I? I yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's wonderful. My background's in architecture, so um, oh, cool. it, it's near and dear to my heart. But um, I would just say again, stressing the the resource of Built Environment Plus. It's made up of building professionals in the Boston area, and and that was the only good thing about COVID was being able to finally attend their meetings remotely and. I just felt like, you know, the little kid going to the city, but it was so back to Don's point, what was so inspiring for me, and, and it's been what's really made me a lot more vocal to advocate for is that we shouldn't have to constantly be, you know, pushing up against all of the project teams or or they should be part of this discussion and leading these discussions and 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 at building environment or built environment plus, that's what it is. It's it's architects, engineers, HVAC contractors, it's the whole spectrum. And so it's just amazing to see kind of the, and, and I will say it, it seems very, in a way, geographic that, that once you get out there, there's just a much more, um, much more expertise because it's just being done so much more and we're going to get there, but I, I beg them for help and, and people have been very generous, but I think we still have a, a ways to go. And we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they have be a fair share of knowledge as well, right? See, we were talking about fair share. Gonna be some fair share of knowledge from the eastern Massachusetts well, here. They have nowhere to put a new building and they have budgets <laughs> to fix yeah, old there buildings. You go. So it's a good combination. <laughs> but you Greenfield's got some great firms and you've got Nessie up there, and yep. that's a great nexus of of A and E professionals. So I think it's uh it's wonderful. Yeah. Any other questions for Carol? Carol, thank you again. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I'm stoked. I think there's opportunity here. Um, a question. Can we reach out if we have any questions? When we, to me? Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. I, I have to say that, um, yeah, I don't know if Stephanie was going to chime in, oh. but if you want to go through Stephanie or, you know, yeah, yeah. Or she can share we'll my information. Yeah, we'll go through Stephanie, but if there's anything that we could do as a company for your town for climate change, let us know. I, <laughs> this is not a local problem to solve, so uh, keep us in mind. Oh, definitely. Thank you. thank you so much, everyone. Carol, thank you so much. Thank and you. best of luck. Thank you, Carol. I'm looking Thanks. forward to reading about your PACE projects. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right, I'm leaving. There we go. So yeah, Laura. Can I say, I, I think we have a, it's something that Stephanie has suggested before, we have a um, to-do uh, action item, which is to try to get someone from mass development to show up at um, a uh, chamber meeting, or what was the other one? Bid. Bid. What's that stand for? Business, Business. Improved, Improvement District. Business Sorry. Improvement District, okay, right. Um, or both. And uh, Stephanie, you said you could take the lead on that, but if you need help contacting someone, if you want, you know, I'm happy to call around at Mass Development and figure out if, if you want help. Well, with that. So we already have the contact. I mean, okay. I think I even have an email um, so I can from Wendy O'Malley, so I can always reach out um, and ask. And I think it's something that I would even want to talk to Sean about. I don't know how much he'd want to get involved in sort of something like this. That would basically just be kind of an educational opportunity, but Sean, you know, sorry. we Sean Sean finance. Mizano, the finance director. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I talk about him a lot now. He and I seem to our communication has increased 
quite a bit. <laughs> so um, I think there's, you know, it's certainly been something that's kind of on his mind that we needed to do more promotion of. And he, there's just, he doesn't have the time. And I, I you know, my involvement can be as much as, you know, just making the connections, you know, like introducing people and you all can sort of set it up with them, but I can sort of do the initial bringing folks together, you know, and identifying the parties that should be involved as well as potentially, you know, the event or, you know, scheduling an event. At this point now, you know, doing things over Zoom is, it makes it a lot easier and I can certainly schedule yeah. a Zoom meeting. <laughs> you know, that's an easy one. Yeah. And, and so do we have contacts of all the business owners in the town? So that's something we can get through the chamber. Okay. I mean, again, you know, the chamber yeah, yeah, has all yeah. of that information. You know, the bid is, okay. the you know, the bid is very much focused kind of on the downtown. The chamber is focused on the area, so it's not exclusive to Amherst. It's you know to other businesses in the in the region, so or the area. So, um, you know, but they do have, like I said, they do have regular meetings where they share information and you can request to be on an agenda. They were having breakfasts. So I don't, I'm not really sure in this sort of COVID era if they um, are still doing that, but I can certainly find out. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to flag again. I thought it was really interesting because, and it kind of reminded me of stuff that Lori has been saying about trouble finding contractors that know how to do some of this stuff. And I just wanted to flag again, I'm just going to like be a broken record about this, but it would be easier to find contractors if like 50% of the population wasn't, okay, not 50, 35% of the population wasn't like functionally excluded from the trades. Like the role of like pregnancy and parental leave in retaining people in the trades. And I do think there's like a public sector maybe a role and maybe a town role and I like don't know what the solution is but like but like I do know that there would be like more contractors if it like were possible to like be a person who bears children like in some of these jobs um so I don't really know what the solution is there but I do wonder I know there's different like incentives for like women-owned businesses and such but I wonder if like in thinking about some of this if there's any way that we can like support as a town businesses that support people through that process um, in terms of like incentives for retaining people, like contractors specifically, um, incentives for like retaining people in the trades through the process of pregnancy and childbirth. I think that would like really be huge as far as just the appeal of those jobs to another huge chunk of people. I also will say that, like, I think it's really important from an equity standpoint because because as all of this like money from all of these programs pours indirectly into like various contractors, and there's like huge inequities gender wise in the trades right now. Yeah, definitely something to be conscious about. Agreed. Thanks, so. Anything else on this topic? Okay, uh, the last topic of today is around um, the unifying theme, Jesse. All right, unifying theme. It's 620. <laughs> I think I've got it down to three sentences, a little more than I wanted. I don't have it memorized yet, but I kind of like where it's headed as potential. And again, this is just uh, something we're all saying. Maybe we're putting in our emails, we're starting our conversations with people who could start that seat, that pace conversation. So I'm gonna read it to you. I'm gonna, if you guys wanna respond now, great. Otherwise, I'm gonna drop it right into the minutes. And we'll keep the conversation going next time. So this is what I've got. We are a citizen group appointed by the town manager to address climate change, resilience, and justice on behalf of the residents of Amherst. Our near-term goal is to reduce emissions by 25% in the next two years. 
How can we help you do this? Think about it. Mull it over. Great, but aren't they going to uh, laugh at us? What's that? What's that? Are, are they going to laugh at us? No. I, I yeah, it's crazy. crazy. I think it's important to start breaking into the, the hard conversation. 25%. We got two years, we have 27 months left. Yeah, I like putting a number that we need to reach while we're communicating the message. And it's actually good for us as well, right? I mean, we don't think about 2025. I mean, it's it's almost there. I like it. I think it's a conversation starter. It's like, what, what do you mean? What is emissions? What do you mean 25%? Like, how could I, what am I supposed to, you know? And it, I think people will have something to say. And I, ideally, if we're doing our jobs right, people will have something to say and we will listen. Do we have any way of knowing? Um, okay, I guess it was past a year ago or enacted, whatever, accepted. Um, do we have any way to know how much we've added or subtracted, not in actual, you know, just ballpark? Like what's, what's been built? What's been rehabilitated? What's been, um, how many more electric vehicles are there? Is, are, are we not gonna have any data on that until after? Yeah, I, I see your point, Andra. I, I think you're talking about what are some of the leading indicators, right? We have a lagging indicator in terms of assessment and GHG emissions. Do we have leading indicators? Yeah. And we don't, that's a great question. We, we probably should. So we know how it's progressing instead of having these assessments every five years inventory assessments every five years, we should be doing something like that. See how many electric cars on the road or something else. I, I don't know. But yeah, yeah, it's definitely worth mulling over. We're starting to do some of, I mean, we're trying to set some of that up now, right? So we've got the company that we're going to work with to do the vehicle inventory and greenhouse gas emissions inventory on, on the vehicle transportation sector of town, uh, the, at least the municipal um, fleet. And, you know, we have the billings too, but those, and those things are getting established so that we can then do regular updates because we're also going to be wanting to update our greenhouse gas emissions inventory from 2017. So we're going to be applying to have a fellow do that. So, you know, we're, that's what one of the things we're trying to do is sort of either establish the baseline, which is the fleet vehicle inventory, and then with the ones that exist, trying to now implement some kind of regular scheduled update. So uh, Stephanie, we, we talked about the dashboard, right? Is somebody, an intern coming in and creating a dashboard. Is the dashboard going to be live-ish? Where... It's not an, it's going to be a little while and it's not an intern. We're actually working, the funding was to work with um, an established company called Kim Lundgren Associates. You can look mm -hmm. them up. But a lot of the communities in Massachusetts like Concord, who is often referenced, <laughs> have a dashboard that was created and developed by KLA Associates. Okay, so that's gonna be more live. I mean, monthly or whatever with- Yeah, that'll be something we'll sort of, yeah, it'll be what we, you know, how we design it and what we have the funding for. And, you know, it's okay. not without a cost. There's um, a cost to have them update it annually. And then there's a package where you can update it, but it's just then gonna be more on, staff to update it and realistically right now staff is me so I, i'm looking for the lighter <laughs> version of you know of keeping that going so i think we just have to talk to them and see what the packages look like yeah i don't want to put more work uh, I, I just i think maybe the year approach is too long um i think we need if we're having conversations with people in the community they need to see 
changes in the scoreboard that's happening live and it's oh no those things happen those things happen regularly i mean it's just in terms of like updating the software and like okay. reassessing you know doing sort of an over an annual kind of overhaul Got if it. you will but no the the whole point of it is that it's sort of regular information okay it's updated so but you know it's again trying to do that in a way where it's not this has been a frustration of mine about the website feature of, you know, the municipality and that departments are kind of left to take care of their own information. And it's hard because it's really time consuming, especially if it's not the primary job that you do. You know, it, it takes a lot. And so I think we want to be realistic about the kind of information we're going to be providing and um, the frequency with which we need to update it. You know, it might be a a bi-weekly thing versus a weekly thing or a day. It certainly won't be daily. <laughs> I can tell you that much. Yeah. And, and when is that going to happen, Stephanie, approximately the time? I don't know exactly. Well, it's all, that's tied with the ARPA funding. So, uh, you know, there's several things that are, I talked to Sean earlier today and we lit literally just threw out like five or six things that are concurrently happening right now. And <laughs> it's a lot. So um, the two things that are kind of really my focus for, um, that are coming up sooner than later are the fellow for the um, the fellow for the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, and then also the building sector inventory. So the vehicle inventory and and the um, building inventory that's just the municipality. And what correct is really going to make the difference is out in the community. So there um, are excise taxes on cars. We should know what kind of cars are being taxed in Amherst. Um, yep. That's, that's data that could be put into dashboard yeah. and updated, you know, that doesn't have to be updated that often every two months. Um, the the company that we're working with, and again, I, we haven't really sat down to sort of look at exactly what we would do yet, um, but the company that we're working with does have some sort of software that updates and um, even if it's not specifically about the town's inventory, it may have some vehicle information that it can sort of populate to make um, you know some of that information available. So again, I just have to sort of, we, me and, you know, and Sean primarily are the ones who are kind of working with them. Um, so I'm going to be a broken record about this. It sounds like if we had more sustainability staff, we could go faster. I 150-200% agree I just because the town just instituted two new departments for DEI and Crest I just don't think it's going to happen for a little bit I don't think it's I don't I wouldn't say that it's like not something the town is thinking about sort of down the road but I think right now with budgets as they are and just bringing on like two whole new departments with significant staffing I just don't think it's going to happen even in the next couple of budget cycles. I think it's going to be a little ways down the road. So I understand that. And our job is to push. Go for it. <laughs> you go right ahead. I'm just, you know, I just know that the conversations I've had internally, that's kind of, you know, that's basically what I've been told. But, you know, other things that I've been told seem to move forward after a while and after enough convincing. So you know, keep, I, I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I agree with Andra. I mean, if Stephanie, you I mean, you have a lot on your plate and if you know, you're the bottleneck, right? I mean, you're, you're taking on a lot. I think having an extra person would actually help, help you and help us as well drive. Cause we, we have to be, I think we're, I wouldn't say being reactive, but it, we're slow. Our, our progress is slow. We got to start thinking about how we can push our agenda in the car. 
So, Andra, I, I know that there was a um, memo or something that was sent out to the town manager before. Um, if you can forward it to me, please. And I want to help Stephanie, but I also want to make sure that, I mean, we're all in this together. I think we're just, we, well, for one, we're doing different things, right? And, and so a focus agenda would help. And then um, helping Stephanie and then having Stephanie help the town and the communities. And, and how can we push that uh, quick enough um, to meet our 2025 goal, right? That's what we need to drive for. So yeah, if you can send me the draft and I can, I, I, I know Stephanie, it might be hard to actually talk to the town manager in person, um, but I mean, I, we gotta do what we have to. So if that means pushing, yeah. emailing, multiple emails. Well, so it's we, the town manager and the town council. It's not just the town manager. Hmm. Okay. So I would say, you know, whatever you wrote before, you, you yeah, I you want to send that along again. And yeah, I, I, I think wanna... one thing that might be interesting is yeah. actually trying to tell a story, right? Is is what are you trying? What are you currently doing, Stephanie? And what are other things in the carp that we can do that we're not doing that we can all possibly draft? And yeah that would require X number of resources or just one resource. Maybe us as ECAC thinking about that is what are all the actions that we wanna drive? And if we just push funnel everything to Stephanie, what is it gonna look like? And if we have an extra person, what could it look like? Um, yeah, and and you know, I will say that in terms of the work, you know, I've always said, and I, I've been saying this from the very beginning, this is a collaborative, like you just mentioned, a collaborative effort. We're working together. We have, you know, our goals are the same goals. So, um, I I think the the benefit of having you all is that mostly what I work with is the municipal side. You know, the municipal stock inventory, and as Andra pointed out, it's really and and again something I've said is that it's the broader community that we need to reach out to, to make change and to have some, you know, um, impact on if we're going to meet our goals. And that's the opportunity that's often harder for me, ironically, to sort of get to is, you know, and, and it also has to do with, you know, policy. I, your conversation earlier about requiring new building to be fossil fuel free that's a conversation that you all can lead, you know, and should lead, quite honestly. And it's one that makes a difference because it will it will go beyond just the municipal side. It's like talking about all building construction in the in the community. And, you know, and if it's you know, if it's a bottleneck at the state level there for that kind of effort to move forward, then that's where, you know, there's collaboration with other communities to try to to push it forward, which has been, you know, that's what those 10 communities are doing. You know, um, that's what the BEA effort was a, was primarily about. So I encourage you to do more of, of that kind of advocacy and work too. The policy development is huge. Yeah, you know, I know we're out of time, but I, we were talking about the unifying theme and you say 25% by 2025, but if there's a question is what are, where are we at now from 2016 level, we don't have an answer. So I think that dashboard is gonna be very important that we use data to drive what we wanna do, but also to be able to communicate to the community on where we're at. So, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I to totally it. agree, Masood, and I really agree. And that's the way we approach all of our, at a building scale, we don't, we don't, the first thing we do is we get a baseline, how much is there? But I, in this case, I also think there's a, a more, um, a, a less divinable aspect of this is just to be like, wait, what, a quarter, 25%? Like just that sort of gut feeling, kind of the way Steve talks about, like just wrapping our heads around just how much solar our share is, like just how much, what does it even look like to do, to have 25% less, like that conversation, like just starting to have it as a, as a sort of visceral somatic conversation of what it means to take something on that's massive and daunting. And that's just the goal for two years from now. 
So I, I think it's it's like a two part thing. It's like, yeah, some real benchmarking, some real what does it really look like? But I don't want to wait for that number because I think it's an emotional conversation as well. It's a lifestyle. You know, it's it's really yeah. about lifestyle choices and decisions, you know, priorities and priorities. I keep saying it's a moral imperative, really, you know, it's an it's our entire economy. It's our culture. It's the way it's our mindset. It's the way we think and, the, and what we believe is true or not true. And it is hard. I just want to say, I think we have till the end of 2025. So really, we could say three years. I mean, we want to do it at the beginning of 2025, but yeah, I, yeah. I think we could do I like it. That. I think we do it at the end. Of, I think the end of 2025 is a more realistic goal. And the, and you know, Vasu, to your question about things I'm working on, you know, the all of the stuff that was put into the ARPA funding was all, you know, things, conversations we had had. I said this before, but mm -hmm. it's conversations I have had with the ECAC, with what's in the CARP, and it was looking at each of those um recommendations for ARPA funding covered each of the sectors that were in the CARP. So there's something representing each sector and with the 2025 goals in mind. So I mean I really think the heat pump thing is going to be a big piece that you know yeah. is important because that will that is one of the few things that I feel like I'm able to work on with you all that will have community wide impact so i really hope we can do a lot with that and i'm i'm hoping that you know the timing of that with the um implementation of the cca will pair well i hope <laughs> okay. also as it turns out 2025 25 percent check out page 25 of the carp that's where it's all summed up <laughs> <laughs> was that intentional <laughs> Nice. I don't, I'm going to ask well you about that one. <laughs> well, well done, Jesse. Be, that'll be uh, on Laura <laughs> and Sarah, really. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> All right. Uh, for the next meeting, oh, Laurie, you had something. No, 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 no. I was just keep going. <laughs> okay. So for our next meeting, agenda items, uh, we have the strategy execution that we want to talk about. Um, did we have anything on CPACE, uh, Don? Uh, do you want to connect with bid and chamber before we meet next week? Yeah, I can reach out to both bid and chamber before we meet. So, and at least have an introductory conversation with them about how we might go about um, advertising, encouraging, soliciting, um, you know, uh, developers in in multifamily residential and in commercial properties who are doing rehabilitations or you know other work on the, on their properties to consider that you know to consider you know moving everything toward um non carbon emitting uh systems and letting them know that there is this program that can help with financing for those sorts of projects. But, but I do think what needs to happen there is we need to get a mass uh, development person. Correct. I was just going to say that as well. Yeah. I was going to say too, just sort of throwing this out there because it came into my head is that, you know, all these projects have to go through, yeah. Um, the inspections department, you know, people have to come in and apply for permits. So yeah. having something available, like if we just have a write up that when they come in, we can have them up front and we can ask the front staff because all the information gets, you know, comes funneling through them, just say hand them, yeah. a, hand, the, hand them this piece of paper to give or send them this email. If they're doing a rehab project, this should go to them. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. doing something like that is a really easy-ish thing to do so it just needs to be developed so but maybe having you know having that in addition to all these other things we're talking about yeah. i just wanted so, to throw so it Don, out i guess maybe for next week it is more about 
thinking about what the ideal process should be or the future process should be, and then communicating yeah. to the rest of us for feedback and then. Although oh, apropos of what Stephanie said, and I don't have a lot of experience in this, but my experience is unlike projects that need to go to the zoning board or the planning board, um, if it's simply a rehab project, uh, most of the time when the applications for a building permit are made, the plans are already prepared and submitted, um, which would include all of the things we're talking about which is why I came back and I was only being a little bit facetious with the architects or whatever professionals are working with um, the developer to put together the development. I mean, because it's harder to go back to the drawing board if, if you're an architect um, or an engineer who's put together a set of uh, a construction drawings to get a building permit um, to then go back and change systems. In, in those drawings. Wouldn't you agree, Jesse? Yeah, it's gonna start with the owner and the developer. Yeah. Whoever's yeah. whoever's paying for the project is gonna initiate that. And they've already decided what they wanna do by the time the architect gets involved. The architect can help, we can push back, we can make, but, but oftentimes that ship has sailed. So I think the bid in the chamber, that's the, that's the good point of entry. And I think it'd be great to, if there if there is a process and a, a leverage point, as we as you might say, I think they would have great input put for that. So I do think that even just informally discussing it with them, saying we're trying to figure out how to, I think they'll have great input. So we're running pretty late here. Um, I sort of have to go. Can we wrap this up? Yeah, I, I think that's fine. I, I just we're talking about the next uh, yeah. agenda item. Is there anything else that we want to cover? Okay. All right. That's all we have. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Thanks great. for staying over. Thank Bye. you all. Bye. Bye all.